My name is Tim. I'll be moderating tonight. You're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. He's You're crazy. crazy. <laughs> and we, um, we're going to do a review. My name is Tim, and welcome to the College of Complexes. Tonight we have Mike Flores speaking tonight on the subject of racism. No, the college and segregation. We all we meet at the Dapper's East restaurant for all for the web audience out there. The college consists of the following format. First we have a brief announcements period, then we have our speaker, then our speakers answers questions, and then we have the infamous rebuttal period where you can speak up to five minutes on any topic of your choice, including or about the speech or not about the speech. We've been meeting continuously since 1951. I'd like to introduce our main speaker now, the Truth Commission on Segregation and its Effects. The United States supported Truth Commissions at the end of apartheid, at the end of the troubles in Ireland and other troubled regions all over the world. Yet when segregation ended, no such commission ever occurred here in the United States. How did segregation work in the U.S.? What were our race laws? Michael Flores returns to hold a truth commission at the College of Complexes on segregation's effects, wounds, and international influence. Let us now welcome Mr. Mike Flores. Yay! Good boy, Mike. Go get him. Looks like a lot of you remember the era of segregation. Uh, we can start with the first slide. Okay, it's what we're getting right now. I just have enough. Pull it off. Sorry, Mike, it's just taking a second to boot. Segregation is over. <laughs> All right, there you go. This is a picture that most people I have met do not have. This is a photo of me with the first girl I ever kissed. You will note she is topless, taller than me, and blonde. Some things don't change. This photo, however, documents something else. My first kiss was illegal. Next slide. Why was my first crush illegal? I had met her at school on a military base in Japan. The military was at that time completely integrated. My parents had met when they were both in the Navy. My father was Mexican and my mother was a Southern white. Had they not been in the military, the Catholic Church would not have married them, and they could have been arrested by the government. But the world I lived in was integrated. There were people of all races in the classes for the kids on the military base. These were the schoolrooms I first heard about equality, justice, and freedom. I had no idea my first crush was illegal. The term out of my league, I didn't know yet, meant stick to your own kind. In 1962, I arrived back in America in the Deep South. To say I experienced culture shock would be an understatement. Next sign. Clan. Okay, good. Actually, is there one before that? No. Uh, no, there wasn't. Okay. But that's no. We no back, back. You're going. To... Okay. 
Okay. It was the <clears throat> it was the first time. Well, in 1962, I arrived back in the Deep South. To say I experienced culture shock would be an understatement. It was the first time I attended a public school. The first day, one of my teachers announced she was retiring from school. The kids started crying. One asked her why. She looked at me and said, because I do not want to teach animals like him. The entire class looked directly at me with rage. My third day of class, at the end of homeroom, three Southern white Baptists were waiting for me to leave class. They blocked my exit and began poking me in my chest. What are you doing, Jew boy? I responded without thinking, I'm Catholic. One of the other boys broke into a smile and said, I ain't never beat up a Catholic before. And he sucker punched me. As I hit the ground, they began kicking and punching me. The homeroom teacher walked out passed by me and said nothing. That night, my face puffy and bruised and my ribs in pain, my father said to me, next time, pick the biggest kid and fight him as if you were fighting for your life. At homeroom, the same teacher who had ignored me being beaten asked me if I had brought the note home and got it signed by my parents. I had received no note. I had no idea what she was talking about. She asked the class if she had given me a note, and the class said, yes, Miss Tucker. I would never see mobs of people as groovy revolutionaries, as Charles does, because of this. She took me to the principal's office and told him I had not only refused to have, give the note to my parents, but denied in front of the entire class she had given me the note. At this point, no one had even asked what the note was. The principal once again asked if I had taken the note to my parents, and I said there was no note. We walked a long walk back to class, and the principal asked the class if she had given me a note. The entire class said she had. Everyone at once said, yes, Miss Tucker. I was learning a lot about people in groups on that day. The principal called my mom, who picked me up from school. She told me to go over what had happened, and I told her. I said I had not received a note from anybody. The next day, my mom put on her Navy uniform and she went with me to school. She went to talk to the principal and I went to the class. At homeroom, the teacher said as I entered, what are you doing here? I said my mom was in the principal's office. She didn't say anything. About 20 minutes passed. The principal entered with my mom, who was in her Navy uniform. He asked the class if the teacher had given me a note. One little girl began to cry. Another began to cry. And one little boy said no. She didn't give him a note. 
He asked the other students, did the teacher give him a note? And they all said no. The next day, the teacher announced she was retiring in two weeks. When people ask me why I turned against the Vietnam War when I was just 12 years old, which would have been in 1964, 66, somewhere around there. I've lied about my age so long, I don't remember. Or why I don't go along with every what everyone believes on Joe McCarthy. It started on that day. I saw a whole group of people lying. I realized large groups of people would willingly believe in a lie if they believed it was the right thing to do. My first expo exposure to the Ku Klux Klan was one of my friends in school. His dad was a Georgia senator and Klansman. His older brother had joined the army to get away from home. He had followed in his brother's footsteps and was also anti-Klan. The KKK in the 1960s ran rodeos, circuses, businesses, restaurants, and entire states of the Democratic Party. There was no internet back then, so I had to go to the library on the bus to read about the Klan on microfilm or microfiche. I was barely 10 years old when I started doing this, and I actually rode the bus without any adult supervision. Today, you don't see that anymore. I was going into the library to try to study what wasn't in my history books. How did the KKK last in the South? Under Calvin Coolidge, the KKK had two wings with two separate philosophies. One was anger against Catholics, Blacks, and Mexicans. But the other wing of the Klan, the one that Calvin Coolidge and Woodrow Wilson supported, believed in separate but equal. Uh, here, next slide. Here is a slide of the Klan in an all-black church. This is a very rare photo. Because the pastor had joined the Klan, the congregation was now protected. Blacks who joined the Klan became informers and created a network where they could spy on whites they worked for and other blacks. Who was pro-union? Who was cheating on their spouse? Who was drinking? Who was dancing? And who was Republican is what black members of the Klan look for. One third of the people lynched by the Klan were white Republicans. Who was reading communist literature could also get you a visit by the Klan. Next slide. I discovered that in the 1870s, the Democratic Party had made an alliance with the KKK, which, when it was revived in the 1920s, because of the film, The Birth of the Nation. Next slide. The way to think about the Klan after The Birth of the Nation came out what I discovered was, I would compare it to Star Trek fan, uh, fandom or Star Wars fandom. People saw the movie. They wanted to imitate what had happened, the clothes. They wanted to learn the language. They wanted to uh, buy 
have as souvenirs, just like people who react to movies today react to Star Trek or Star Wars. Uh, in Star Trek, you learn the language Klingon. There's a secret language to the clan. If you ever see a license plate that says Akaya, A-K-A-I, it means a clansman, or A-K-I-A, it means a clansman I am. So they have these secret codes, just like people who like Star Trek learn Klingon, uh, etc. So it was really the first movie fandom that erupted, the second clan in the 1920s. Wilson, a clansman, would show the film to foreign dignitaries in the White House to explain why Americans needed the Klan. Wilson is the father of the modern progressive liberal movement. Uh, next slide. Now this is very rare. This is even rarer than the picture I showed before. This is a black man joining the Ku Klux Klan. We now know that there were about 20,000 black members of the KKK um, during the period from the 1920s up until the beginning of World War II. Now this was in all chapters of the Klan, but it was many of the chapters. The photograph that you see here was actually taken by a police informer who used it in a uh, to do reconnaissance or gather information for the FBI. It is the only known photo of a black being initiated into the Klan. Um, and it was taken by an informer. Now, next. Um, this is from Connecticut. Up until the 1930s, about mid-1930s, this was called a whipping post. Blacks in the North, this was not a Southern thing, this was something that happened in the North. Blacks were tied to this whipping post, beaten, spat on, humiliated. Many died during this ordeal. You know that there are children watching this happen. This was legal and it was sanctioned in the North by the Democratic Party. Next slide. Here we have something unusual. This was a comic book given out in Alabama by George Wallace. Um, and you can see there he's explaining why segregation is a good thing. This was distributed to people throughout Alabama in order to get uh, votes. He was running for governor. He had actually run once before, but when he had run uh, for governor months before, he had said he wanted to give blacks the vote. Well, he lost. And he said he would never do that again. And after that, he embraced the Klan. What was this world that I was in? Living in Virginia, then South Carolina, and finally Atlanta, Georgia. All the definitions about justice, equality, and freedom seem completely out of place here in America when I got here. They worked fine on the military base in Japan where all the classes were integrated, but I did not understand this world at all. I was literally a stranger in a strange land. Cantrell's book swap shop was where all the kids went when they wanted to buy old comic books. That was in Atlanta, Georgia. This was before people knew comic books were worth money. I bought Spider-Man number one for 50 cents. Today, it sells between twenty-five and $36,000. No, I don't have it anymore. I think I sold it when it hit $100, because I thought no funny book would go over one or $200 in value. Ooh, that was a mistake. Cantrell also sold in his swap shop old 78s, 
78s were records before 33s and 45s that were made by the Klan. The Klan had records out, marching songs and things like that. I had, and then they had something else in that shop. Decades of old racist souvenirs. What were these and what did they mean? I had learned that Wilson had created the modern liberal and progressive movement. It was when Wilson, who created the Federal Reserve System, solidified the federal income tax, began the Food and Drug Administration, the Interstate Commerce System, the FCC, and the Federal Trade Commission, he was aggressively anti-capitalist, had planted in the center of all these organizations the ideas of segregation and using these groups to keep blacks down. What I didn't learn until years later was that monopolies that had never existed before came in with all these new administrations and offices and regulations. It would be years before I understood that all these government administrations and agencies had one overriding goal, to suppress blacks and other minorities. Thomas Leonard at Princeton University wrote that the embracing of eugenics as the core belief of liberalism would create a movement that would forever carry a smugness why? Why do people feel smug about all this? Why do they feel smug now? Because they felt they were superior to the races they were crushing. Margaret Sanger, founder of Planned Parenthood, called for the extermination of the feeble, of minorities by using sterilization and birth control. Economists Irving Cope Fisher, Frank Fetter, Simon Patton, and Edward Ross saw blacks and immigrants as threats to white culture and fought for a minimum wage to keep blacks, Mexicans, and others in low-paying jobs. Unemployment and a living barely minimum wage would be used to keep black and minorities from working in white culture. Progressives believed every time the minimum wage went up, young blacks and immigrants would become unemployed and unions could ask for more money. Regulation by government, by definition, restricts economic output. Those who are at the head of the line and can make a deal with the government prosper and whites are always at the head of the line. When FDR began the National Recovery Act, the black press of the day called it the Negro Removal Act, Negroes Rarely Allowed Act, even Negroes Robbed Again Act. Huh. FDR had said that if we reduced economic output, that would fight unemployment. It was a spectacular failure. All of these measures were now taught were to help blacks. Yet from 1950 today, the black unemployment gap has always been higher than whites. Baltimore today is ruled by a progressive establishment. Baltimore is always open to high-profile economic development subsidized by the government and carried out by politically correct connected whites. The benefits are almost always for whites alone. Here in Chicago, we have a restaurant right in Millennium Park that pays $1 a year rent and no sales tax. It's subsidized by the Chicago government. 
How does that help blacks? Let's look at the souvenirs of racism and what they mean. Oh, this is an interesting, this was from a riot that happened here in Chicago. You'll notice that the riot began, and the word they use is after a, a black child invaded the white beach. Actually, he just swam accidentally over into another part of the water, and that launched a riot where three people died and 50 were hospitalized. Next slide. Next slide. Um, these were the kinds of signs that I saw as a kid when I first arrived in the South in 1962. Next slide. Get your next, uh, get your next presentation. That's it. <laughs> to justify the violence and exclusion of blacks from society, artifacts like this existed in pop culture. This is a grave reminder of what whites and government actually feel. In the 1900s through the 1930s, postcards of black children used as alligator bait were popular. Next slide. Here we have a license plate mocking LBJ's campaign slogan. Next slide. This target was used by police until the 1978 in most cities. It is still used by police in some cities. Next slide. This was a popular dartboard for bars. So if you went into a bar, you would see this uh, dartboard. Next. The black mammy figure was wildly popular until the 1960s and was used as everything from a salt shaker to a cookie jar. Next. This postcard may seem innocuous, black children skinny dipping until you see the writing at the bottom of the card that says alligator bait. <laughs> By the way, did you know vagrancy laws first came into effect to arrest freed slaves as they left the plantations? Once they left the plantations, they didn't have a home. They were going to look for a home. So, the sheriff or the police would sit outside the plantation, wait for them to leave, and then arrest them for vagrancy. Pretty good trick. That's why so many slaves stayed on the plantation after the slavery ended. Because they knew if they walked off the plantation, they'd be asked, where do you live? They'd say, well, I'm going to go and find a place, and would be immediately arrested for vagrancy. So that's the origin of our vagrancy laws. Yeah. Next. Minstrel shows were wildly popular in America until World War II. Next. This high school minstrel book was handed out at the school. Um, Abraham Lincoln's favorite form of theater was minstrel shows. Minstrel shows were the number one form of comedy. Amos and Andy actually grew out of the minstrel shows. That was the most popular comedy show in American history. But whites don't like to talk about it anymore. Next. I have no idea what this is supposed to mean, but it just shows the way uh, black caricatures were used uh, on everything from postcards to Valentine cards to Christmas cards and more. Next. This is the song where the term coon first comes from. Um, it came out in 1901, obviously to describe black people, and that's the origin of the word. Next. In the U.S., this sign 
had many variations. Um, sometimes I mentioned Mexicans instead of Jews because there weren't a lot of Jews living in the South. Um, but you saw it at bars, restaurants, stores. Um, next. I have to get the next slideshow ready. Okay. Sorry, Mike. Okay. This is a copy of a um, poll tax receipt. Many states uh, charged people to vote. So if you wanted to vote, you had to pay a poll tax, and that was your receipt. Um, this was an attempt to keep poor people uh, from voting. In fact, sometimes uh, if you wanted to pay the poll tax in the white neighborhood, it was a penny. But if you lived in the black or Mexican neighborhoods, it was two, three, four, five dollars, which was in in those days a lot of money. Think, I mean, an average movie theater ticket was five or ten cents. So being told, well, you can vote if you pay us five dollars, kept blacks from voting. Um, next. <coughs> We have all kinds of examples of books, Little Black Sambo and others, that were actually used to teach white kids to read. So from the first grade, these messages were being sent to whites as children of how to think about black people. Uh, next. This is a, a creamer. In other words, this sat on somebody's kitchen table, and this is what they poured cream out of to put on coffee. Next. Um, this is a nostalgia card from 1906. It's nostalgic for the days of slavery when black, little black girls were put in charge of babysitting. So the, from the youngest age on in slavery, they were expected to earn money uh, or save money for their master. And this way they didn't have to pay for an au pair or a babysitter. They just used the children of the slaves. Next. Now, in the 1800s, the Jezebel appeared in pop culture. Now you have to realize, in white culture, expression of sexuality was forbidden. White people were very uptight about sexuality from the 1800s, probably until the 1920s. In the 1920s, whites loosened up about sexuality. However, black people could be shown as sex objects all the time. That wasn't considered in bad taste. And that's where you get the figure of the Jezebel. Next. This is the Sapphire. Sapphire is also the name of a character on the Amos and Andy TV show. And what Sapphire was, was the opposite of the Jezebel. Sapphire was the woman who would berate and humiliate and uh, yell at uh, her lazy black husband or son and the sapphire figure was very popular in segregation. Next. Now this is interesting. Um, one of the things about the racial codes of the day was that whites had really uh, defined to a fine point um, what it meant to be white. And in America, that meant if you had one drop, it was called the one drop law, of any other race, Indian, black, uh, you know, nowadays you would hear white people say, oh, I'm part Cherokee. They're never part Apache. They're never part of the warrior tribes. They always say, oh yeah, I'm part Apache. I'm 5% Apache or 1% Apache or something like that. And, uh, um, but they, they had defined what it meant to be white. Um, during segregation, uh, President Obama would not 
have been, can you still hear me? Yeah, just turn it down a little bit. Okay. Uh, during the segregation, President Obama would not have been called black or African. Americans in those days would have called him a mulatto or a high yellow. Um, that was the, just the term used to describe people who were half black. They were not black. Um, this film that you see here is actually about a very real thing that happened in the black community. Blacks who discovered they were light in skin and had straight hair would pass in white culture. That's what this movie is about. Um, this one starred Rita Moreno, uh, who was uh, Rita Marina, who was a famous actress. And she plays a girl passing as white, even though she's, she's actually black. Um, this worry wipes no end. It wasn't just the source of movies. And this movie isn't old. It's not from the 1900s. This is from the 1950s. Interesting thing, there was a book out called Black Like Me, where a man changed the pigment of his skin, went into the black culture, and wrote about it in the book. And at the end of the book, he ends by saying that he would never, uh, it, 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 at the end of the book, he states he would never be part of black culture because of the way they're treated by our society. But there were other books and movies about people pet trying to pass as white. Next. This Valentine card shows how whites laughed at the way blacks dressed. And this is from 1907. Sometimes you'll see on the internet pictures of black people at proms and stuff, and whites delight in seeing the homemade clothes they put together. And uh, that actually began in 1907. Um, next. Now in 1900, charge Charles Carroll published The Negro Abyss and stated whites were created in God's image while blacks didn't even have a soul and were incapable of feeling pain. The reason we have the laws we do about cocaine today is that the police actually believed a study that stated a person on cocaine could not be stopped by a 22 caliber gun. And that was when police started carrying 38 revolvers. See, there's a reason for all these things. So police to this day carry a 38 revolver uh, because it's the only way to stop a black person on cocaine, or so they believe. So what? Next. Uh, go on to the next one. Now these are uh, party cards. Uh, there used to be a game that would grow into the 1960s and would be called charades. But in the 1930s, when it first appeared, it was called party stunts. And all of the party stunts would mimic the actions of black people. So the origins of charades uh, was actually this game where, for example, it says, uh, imitate a black person eating cornbread. Um, next. Now this is a cream of wheat ad, which shows a black child stealing apples and trying to escape from the duck guard dog. Um, this was the world revealed to me by Cantrell's Swap Shop when I saw all of these things for sale. I was a stranger in a strange land, trying to understand a world I was dropped into. In Mein Kampf, Hitler declared, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. In Mein Kampf, Hitler declared that America was the only nation on earth creating a healthy race-based country 
U.S. immigration law was set up to preserve the Nordic race in the U.S. Our first race laws were in 1790, when we opened citizenship to any alien, free, white person. In 1934, in preparation for the Nuremberg Laws in Germany, the Minister of Justice held a special talk on American race laws and told the Nazis they need to imitate these. However, there was one law they didn't imitate. There was one law that they thought was cruel and unjust to use against people. That was the one drop rule that the U.S. had. The Nazis thought the one drop rule went too far. So that was the only law in the Nuremberg Laws that the Nazis didn't have. All of their other laws came from America's laws. Keep in mind, in the 1930s, the Nazi plan wasn't to kill Jews, they wanted to send them all to Palestine. So even if Hitler had won, the remaining Jews would have ended up in Palestine, which still would have pissed off the Palestinians, and it'd still be a mess. The irony is, the Nuremberg trials of the Nazis happened in Nuremberg. And guess what laws most of them were tried under? The very same laws we still had on the books in America. So while we told the, the world we were shocked they had uh, rules and laws based on the Nuremberg laws, all of those laws were based on our laws, which when the Nuremberg trial happened, were still in effect here. How did blacks and the black family survive slavery, segregation? What happened? They had created an alternate universe. There were black nightclubs called the Chitlin Circuit. Oh my God. where blacks could perform. The church helped keep the families together, the moms and the dads. Music, like the blues, was something whites weren't even aware of when they, it first appeared. There were black films and authors whom whites had never heard of. President Johnson began a war on poverty to end poverty in America forever that would end up costing $22 trillion. In 1964, the poverty level was 18% of the country. I'm happy to tell you today that after $22 trillion, the poverty level has gone from 18% all the way down to 16.5%. Who knows, maybe another 100 or 200 trillion more and we can get it down to 14%. The war on poverty was a continually mismanaged disaster. It effectively did what the KKK, slavery, and white laws could not do. It destroyed the black family by making the father irrelevant. It replaced the family with government dependency. 80% of black children born up until 1964 had a father and a mother. In 2012, 80% of black children born in America are born to a single unmarried parent. The government spends $65,000
for each of those families per year. You know, I think it would uh, just save us a lot if we just gave them $65,000 and said, here, go do your best. I asked a newspaper reporter if he realized that a $15 an hour minimum wage would close one-third of bars and restaurants in Chicago. And he replied, well, yes, I know, but don't worry, there's still plenty of restaurants and bars you can go to. I said that would put all of those people out of work. He said he knew but, he said, watch, after we pass the $15 minimum wage, government workers will ask for a raise. I said, are you kidding? This city's broke. He said, you watch. And that's what we really want, he said with a smile. The government has created a deficit between whites and blacks in education, income, and net worth. Yet since 1964, we just keep doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different outcome. Then I began to realize it is an insanity. It isn't a mistake. It is the result Democrats have wanted since the 1870s. Democrats fought to expand slavery, pass discrimination codes and laws, passed the Missouri Compromise to protect slavery, supported the Dred Scott decision, opposed educating blacks, and horsewhipped and killed white teachers who tried to teach them. They fought anti-lynching laws. Sen Senator Robert Byrd was a grand dragon in the Ku Klux Klan. Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton both state that Robert Byrd is their mentor and hero. To be a grand dragon meant that you gave the order on who was killed and who was tortured and who was beaten. But to the Clintons, he's a hero. Bird filibustered against the Civil Rights Act for 19 hours to keep it from being passed. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. Um, this was a popular figure, the idea that a black child was somehow neutral in color and would drink what was called nigger milk, which is shown here as ink, and that would turn him black. Next. Um, here we have the white woman with her dog and luggage and the lazy black uh, porter behind her. Next. Okay. Gotta get the... Uh... Woodrow Wilson, a Klansman, introduced national segregation as his first act in becoming president. FDR, to show his support of the Klan, appointed Klansman Hugo Black to the Supreme Court. He also picked Klansman Harry Truman in 1944 as his vice presidential candidate. FDR fought the integration of the military. Truman, as you know, had been told that Japan had been trying to surrender, had only wanted to keep their emperor as the only demand. We said no demands, unconditional surrender. Two weeks before the atomic bombs were dropped, Klansman Truman um, was told by Joseph Stalin that Japan had been trying to surrender for a year. They knew it. 
using the atomic bombs on them was considered wrong by Stalin. Think about that for a minute. Truman made a racist joke. Uh, it's interesting to note that after we dropped the two atomic bombs, we told Japan, oh, you can keep your emperor. The only demand they have. That's why in Japanese history books, they do not say it was an unconditional surrender. In Japanese history books, they say it was a conditional surrender. If you ask to keep the emperor, and then they tell you you can, that's a condition. Americans are not taught that. You'll notice here something you don't see very often anymore. Before 1964, these photos are from. There's a mom, and there's a dad. Next. Here we have a family, also before 1964. They had kept their ties through slavery. They had kept their ties through segregation. But they couldn't keep those ties together when the whites came to help. <laughs> Democrats opposed the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the Constitution the Reconstruction Act, the first Civil Rights Act, the KKK Act of 1871 that would have banned the KKK. Next. The Civil Rights Acts of 1875, the Freeman Bureau, the Civil Rights Acts of 1957 and 1960. Democrats lynched, burned, mutilated, and murdered thousands of blacks and white Republicans, and even destroyed entire towns such as Rosewood, Florida, the Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wilmington, North Carolina, and the list goes on and on. When I left Japan, I came to America, next, I had no idea why the hatred was so strong by people who did not know me. Why they all stood together against me. But now I know. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mike, I'm uh, going to let you do the moderating for the questions yourself by calling on people because we are going to be staying back to film. Let's hear it. Give it up again for Mike. Give a very Mike. decent presentation tonight. I applaud him for his work. And uh, Thank you shake your hand and uh, congratulate you on a well done presentation. So go ahead and let's get right to the questions. Okay. Any questions? The first one is, yeah. <laughs> have you ever seen a, do you think we've actually gotten any better since 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act? My contention is that's the first time that blacks were allowed full citizenship, or do you think it's going to take another generation or two for that to become integrated, for full integration to occur, like other minority groups? Um, well, that's an interesting question because Chicago is called the most segregated city in America. And in those, one of the things that ended segregation was a court fight over the right to have guns. Black people could have a hunting rifle or a shotgun, but were not allowed to have pistols. A lawsuit allowed blacks to have handguns. All of a sudden, the riots where whites would go into a black community and shoot it up or burn it stopped. Those kind of race riots stopped because blacks could have guns. Right now in Chicago, there is a lawsuit going on because black people in zip codes are not allowed to get gun permits while whites in all areas are allowed to get gun permits. 
So we're right back where we started from. Um, in the old days, a black person could buy a hunting gun, a rifle or a shotgun, but couldn't have a handgun. Then a lawsuit meant they could get a handgun, and the practice of whites going into black neighborhoods and shooting them up stopped immediately because people could fight back. Today, we're supposedly totally integrated. Obama came from here. Segregation's long gone. The Democratic Party is now a totally different party, except black people aren't allowed to have handguns. I have no idea how this will end. Uh, but it hasn't changed in my opinion. And since 1964, only one and a half percentage points difference in the poverty level after $22 trillion. How anyone can consider that a victory is beyond me. So I, I can't answer your question. I don't know what it will take to change those ingrained right attitudes but you have to realize that everything from the uh, government offices that register guns um, to uh, every administration begun uh, by Woodrow Wilson um, was set up at its core belief was to oppress blacks. And those agencies are still there, and no one has tried to clean them up. Any question? Yeah. Uh, what is a Ku Klux? What is a Ku Klux? Uh, what does the words mean? Or? Ku Klux. Well, Ku Klux Klan uh, was originally formed by, um, uh, I know this. Uh, right. Uh, a horse cavalryman, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, Robert E. Lee uh, gave them the name Invisible Empire. Uh, he also didn't like the Ku Klux Klan, but the Klan in that time also admitted blacks. Um, Forrest ended up breaking up the group because some of the ancillary groups were engaging in violence that he thought went too far. And then, of course, we hit 19... Uh, the 1920s after the birth of a nation uh, where it became very popular. Now the Ku Klux Klan back then um, was not made up of southern hillbillies. We had a Supreme Court justice. We had five presidents who were members of the Klan. There has never been an article or book written about how did their being members of the Ku Klux Klan, five presidents, um, that's over, what, 40 years of rule by the Klan? There's never been an article or story about how their beliefs in the Klan affected what they did. But I, I can give you an example of how it did. Um, Truman freed all the Japanese spies, or excuse me, all the German spies uh, from uh, prison and also repealed their death sentences after, at the end of the war. So all German uh, who were up to be hanged here in the U.S. or who had been caught as spies were freed by Truman. All Japanese were hung. <laughs> so, you know, because Asians are not the same race. So, uh, But there's never been a study done on how for over 40 years believing in the Ku Klux Klan affected President Wilson, McKinley, um, Truman, any of those guys, Coolidge. Um, you had doctors, lawyers, uh, politicians. It was very different than it is now. Yeah, I mean, today, my joke is, what do you get when you have uh, 12 Klansmen at a rally? 300 protesters and eight of the 12 are all FBI informers. <laughs> so they're not, uh, they're not, despite all the claims uh, that the Ku Klux Klan swung the vote for uh, Trump and all that, there's not enough of them to do it. Um, you could fit all the Klansmen today probably 
who would go out on a march in this room nationally. Yeah. Uh, you said when you came back to the United States uh, after the war, I presume. Oh, no, 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 I'm not that old. I'm sorry. <laughs> You said when you came back to the United States. Yeah, from a Japanese, from Japan. People stood against you. Correct. And uh, you didn't understand what you know now. Correct. Why did people stand against you? Um, well, I think the, at first they thought I was Jewish, and then I made the mistake of saying I was Catholic. Now, here's the thing. The Klan actually hated Catholics more than blacks. In fact, the Ku Klux Klan broke up at the beginning of World War II so that they could say, uh, we're not members of the Klan to join the military. Why would they want to join the military to fight Germany? Because Hitler was Catholic. To them, Hitler was the fulfillment of their belief that Hitler was and the Pope were working together. And they would point to Italy and say, well, look, Mussolini and the Pope. They're right there. They have dinner together. And uh, so there was more hatred for Catholics, I think, uh, than blacks in the Klan at that period. In fact, today, if a Klansman came back to life and went to a KKK rally and saw Nazis with the Klan, he would beat the hell out of the guys in the Klan because they hated Catholics that much. And to them, fascism and Nazism was just another word for Catholicism. So they disbanded during World War II. Now, um, the idea that whites were racially superior was taught to the children at a young age by reading books like Little Black Sambo, by having objects around their house that uh, uh, showed blacks in a uh, lazy or bad way. Um, in a stereotypical way. So whites were being taught this from the time they were born. Um, I had been in a military base in Japan uh, as a kid and was in a class where it was integrated because the military was integrated. It's an interesting question. Um, I believe the most revolutionary force in the United States that's actually done the greatest change is our military. Not unions, not communists, not socialists, not democrats, not republicans, not conservatives. The military. The military integrated when this country didn't want integration. The military accepted gays when our population generally did not want gays. The military put women on the front lines now what happens is what happened to me. Here I am in a class with a white girlfriend, the first girl I ever kissed. Here I am hearing about freedom and justice, and I end up in the deep south where they say, you don't get freedom and justice. It's not for you. It's for white people. I just came from a military base. Can you imagine how that sounded to a black or Mexican soldier who came back here? I can tell you how it sounded. That's why my mother put on her Navy uniform when she went to talk to the principal at the school and get me back in. Um, if you teach people they're superior to other people, it gives them a reason to feel smug. Smugness is the enemy of intellectual inquiry. It's the enemy of finding out that you're wrong, finding out a new idea, being smug, feeling smug over somebody else, clinging to ideas that make you feel smug happens all the time. It's what everyone knows. It's what everyone believes. Mike, why don't you go along with what everyone knows? Why do you have to go to the library and spend hours? Forget it. Just go along with what everyone thinks. Uh, Charles. Okay. Yeah, everyone's complaining. Republicans are complaining about the Affordable Care Act. But as it turns out, they have nothing to replace it with. You don't like the war on poverty. 
But if I look back historically, I don't see what the Republicans had to replace it with. It, was it benign neglect? Or maybe trickle down? Or maybe they just didn't care about those black people, did they? Well, actually, the... Unless you can tell me what program, the name of the program, they had for the black people. <laughs> you just showed us 50 slides about. What's the name of the program they replaced the war on poverty? Well, most of the presidents we had in the 20th century were Democrats. I'd like to know and the name of the Republican the program. But you did mention the Health Care Act. And there is actually a counter to the Health Care Act, uh, which has been uh, proposed by Rand Paul of the Republican Party. Um, so there is an uh, optional health care program. Why is he going up, up to protest? But uh, as a matter of fact, the, um, I believe the only people who are going to have any effect on Trump, I tried with the Democrats, I begged with them, I said, please, Quit calling Trump supporters Nazis and Klansmen. I begged them. I said, don't do this resistance thing. Try to win back the working class and the middle class. They refuse to listen. You've seen my Facebook page. They say, I'm not going to talk to a Nazi. I don't care who they are. I say, hey, it, Democrats are still a political party. They have to win elections. What are you guys doing? And they insist, nope. No, we don't. We can resist. We can resist everything he does. Well, right now, the last poll that came out from CNN and NBC shows that 23% of Democrats support the resistance and actually don't like seeing pictures of cars set on fire, windows busted, free speech rallies broken up. They don't like it. 23% and they don't care. The leadership does not care at all. Doesn't bother them one tiny bit if they go down to 5%. They only have five states now out of the 50. The Democrats only have five states and they still won't change. Damn it, they're gonna go down fighting. Well, they're going down, that's for sure. Um, I've, I've begged, I've pleaded, I've written, I've talked. You've got to win over the workers in the middle class. You have got to win over the people. I say to him, look, I honestly believe that if Bernie Sanders had been the candidate, a lot of people who voted for Trump would have voted for Bernie. Because they weren't voting for Trump. They were voting a protest vote. And they say, no, Mike, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. The people that voted for Trump are Nazis. They never would have voted for Bernie Sanders. I don't think that's true. But I, I do believe that right now the Democratic Party is in a state of denial that it had a massive, uh, massive breakdown in the last election which they have been unable to face a uh, spectacular failure, which they have blamed on everyone from the Russians, uh, to sun got in their eye, um, to those lousy, stinking Nazi Klansmen workers. Um, they blamed everybody, but no one has looked at what they did. Maybe they ran the wrong candidate. Maybe Hillary wasn't the right candidate. You say that and people are ready to fight. Maybe they made a mistake by taking the workers and middle class for granted. You say that and people are like, how can you say that? You're just spreading hate. You're just a hate monger. Well, if that makes me a hate monger, I'm a hate monger. And if the Democrats don't change this road that they're on, they're going to go from five states to four to three to two. They're going to go the way of the know-nothings the Whigs, um, the other parties, the Progressive Party, all of these parties that existed, and they couldn't keep up the pace. You didn't have some questions yet. Back in 20 minutes. I said Rand yeah. Paul uh, proposed the the a fair option. on poverty? A free market. Oh. Right now, uh, for me to get my licenses to do tour guiding, 
just to guide tours, cost me $8,500. That's to walk around and tell people about the city. I had to pay the city $8,500. If you want to do nails, if you want to manicure nails in this city, it's $7,500 for a license, and you have to take city-certified courses. So it's $12,000. How is a person in the ghetto going to get together $12,000? So your solution for the nationwide war in poverty is to give tours. Is to have a... And do oh, that, That's ridiculous. That's what said. Forget it. I did That's not. your program. You're not listening and you what don't understand. What is your program? You don't comprehend. Give free tours? Get rid of the licensing You can have two license. Get rid of licensing. I shouldn't have to pay $7,500 to the city in order to give a tour. A poor person should not have to give $12,000 to the city. They have licenses across the country. Okay, whatever. Well, yeah. What does the fiber have to pay for that? That I don't know. They don't have licenses across the United States. Actually, to do hair, to do styling, to do hair coloring, all has to be licensed and accredited, and you have to take classes. Yeah. Uh, don't you think the fact that Hillary Clinton said she was going to maintain the Obama policies and raise taxes was largely responsible for her losing the election. I think that played a big role. Um, I also think she really was kind of weak on what she said she was going to do. She, at Joe Biden, there's a couple of Democrats who are, are begging with the party to stop what they're doing. And Joe Biden um, said that she never gave a reason to vote for her. <laughs> she always just presumed she had it it tied up. The night before the election, she was at a gangster rap concert. She didn't go to Ohio. She didn't go to Pennsylvania. She didn't know the pain those people were in. What actually got Trump elected was that people are stuck in bad mortgages and they can't sell their homes and the businesses that used to pay them a high salary have left the country have left where they are. It was always part of America that you could move to get a job. You could go to another state. But people in Ohio, Pennsylvania, in the South, all across the Midwest and East Coast are stuck with houses with high mortgages, leftovers from the uh, repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act by Bill Clinton, and their job is gone. So now they're working for minimum wage or near minimum wage, and they know no one's going to buy their home if there's no jobs nearby. That's why people are in pain. And the Democrats didn't see it. They didn't feel it. They didn't understand what was happening. They misunderstood it. Hillary was smart. She had already, a couple of years earlier, lined up all of the superdelegates so that she would get the nomination. If she hadn't received one vote, and Bernie Sanders had received all the votes, she would have won the nomination on the superdelegates. Then she had a plan. She didn't need the people. She only needed a few states to get the electoral votes, California and a couple others. Turns out she only got two of those three states. But her plan was, why waste time talking to these peasants when I can hang out with Madonna? and Katy Perry, and people who donate millions of dollars to my foundation. Nobody in Ohio has millions of dollars to give her. So Hillary had lined up a battle plan where she didn't need anybody. She only needed to carry three states to get the electoral votes. She didn't need to waste time on those dirty, filthy people in Ohio who shop at Walmart. She didn't have to deal with those people. She could deal with celebrities from Hollywood. She could go to corporations and banks and Wall Streets and raise millions of dollars. And yet, no one thinks that's a problem. They think my analysis is flawed. They think I'm wrong. 
The Democrats didn't do anything wrong, they say. There were no mistakes made. It was the Russians. It was Trump. It was Nazism. It was skinheads. Blame, 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 blame. Nobody has stopped to say, why was she at a gangster rap concert in Los Angeles when she should have been in Ohio giving a talk? Why was she at a Katy Perry concert two nights before when she should have been in Pennsylvania? And you know what? She was the first Democrat in history to run promising three things. She would end the coal industry and put 1.5 million people out of work. 1.5, that must have gone over really big in Virginia. 1.5 million people out of work. She said this with a smile on her face. She said she would invade Syria and overthrow Assad and we would attack Iran. Those were her three-point platform. Trump responded by saying, no more regime change. I am not going to use the CIA to overthrow other governments while I'm in because that's not in our Constitution. A lot of people in the military heard that and did not respond by saying, that proves he's a Nazi. That proves he supports the, the Klan and the skinheads. A lot of people in the military heard that and said, yeah, we shouldn't be overthrowing governments. Okay, Mike? Yeah. Okay. One more, yeah. who's up? Okay, uh, the Republican Party has the House. The Republican Party has the Senate. The Republican Party has the presidency, and the Republican Party has uh, talks that uh, appears to Sixty-eight percent of the nation's legislature is now Republican. So, but it's Russia's your fault. premise is the Truth Commission on Segregation and its effects, it should be no problem then for the party of Abraham Lincoln. Oh, uh, don't bring him up. To... <laughs> address the crimes committed in the United States of America against descendants of the transatlantic slave trade through economic justice, better known as reparations. Could you comment on that? Well, at $22 trillion, there's a lot of reparations. But um, I would say uh, no. Uh, the agencies that were set up, that at their core, in the beginning, were set up to defend white rights and segregation, should all be ended from the FDA on. I would say that permits and licensing laws where the city bleeds you dry, hey, let me bring it home to you, forget what I had to pay to be able to do tours. What the hell is a seven cent a bag tax for? They say, oh, we're going to help the environment help the environment, where are you giving the money to? Don't ask, don't tell. I'll tell you where that money's going, to make up for all the money they stole from the firemen, from the police, from the librarians, from the teachers' pensions, to try to get the Olympics. Remember that? What happened to our parking meters? You know, libertarians have always said when you approach government, look at what works. Keep it. Look at what doesn't work. Try to fix it. If it can't be fixed, end it. End it. If you can't fix it and it isn't working, end it. So what did Chicago do? We took the most profitable thing we had, money from parking, tickets, and we gave it to a foreign country so that Daly could get the Olympics, which we didn't get. Okay. Are you kidding me? You guys really think that's good economics? You can defend that? Okay. You can defend the restaurant in Millennium Park that pays a dollar a year rent and no sales tax? That's how the city raises money? You can defend this ripoff of the seven cent bags? How do you folks sleep at night? At some point you have to say, 
maybe I've been backing the wrong horse. The only way to affect Trump, the only way to protest him, we must go issue by issue, and I hate to say it, it has to be done within the Republican Party, whether you join the Libertarian ring or the regular Republicans. It's the only way to put pressure on him. It's the only way to protest. If you honestly believe throwing a chair through a window and setting fire to a car and beating up someone for wearing a Trump button is going to convince Trump to do anything, you are out of your damn mind. We're going to have to go to rebuttals now, Mike. It's okay. 7.56. Uh, let's thank Mike again, please. Well, yeah, boy, Mike. Uh, this is all right. Yeah. Let's just talk. I'll move on tonight. Uh, okay. Um, we'll go about five minutes each on the rebuttals. Uh, if there's more and we need to have time to do a second round, we will. But, Mike. Thank you again uh, for a good talk. Go easy. Uh, I may no. say a few remarks at the end. Uh, I do have a old libertarian campaign commercial to run at some uh, point that might just kind of give you a little bit of refresher of what we could have had. Uh, <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Five minutes. First rebutter up. Good evening. My name is David Travis. Uh, I think that uh, Mike Flores is it? Yes. makes uh, many, many very good points. And yes, we did have racism in this country, and it ran pretty rampant. But uh, I think uh, our speaker neglected to say that uh, there were many slave owners who treated their slaves humanely. And after the Civil War, there were many people who treated black people humanely, and that uh, there were black people uh, when, when virtually no one gave blacks a chance or a job, uh, Jewish people generally did. They gave blacks jobs as maids in their houses, and they gave blacks jobs as porters in their stores and whatever else, uh, when virtually no one else would. Uh, black people were very good, I mean Jewish people were very good about helping them. Uh, I want to point out that the worst example that uh, Mike wants to hold up, which is Little Black Sambo, should not be used because if anyone has ever read the story of Little Black Sambo, it actually is very pro-black. Uh, little Black Sambo is the story of a little black boy whose mother gives him a jug and tells him to walk across the jungle to go get butter. And he has on his, his best clothes and uh, as he goes through the jungle, he keeps encountering tigers who tell him that they're going to eat him up. And he says, if you won't eat me, I'll give you my hat, or I'll give you my pants, or I'll give you my jacket. And by the time he gets to the other side of the jungle, he's given up all his clothes, and these tigers are all there together to get him. And he, he, um, uh, he, he told each tiger that they'd be the snazziest most well-dressed tiger in the whole jungle, and then they get in a fight with each other, and they chase each other around a tree till they wear a ditch in the ground, and then run so fast that they melt it into butter, and little black Sambo takes the jug and scoops up the butter, puts the clothes back on, and goes back home, and eats more pancakes than anybody else in his house. That is not anti-black or racist. It, it gives little black Sambo the credit for being uh, so smart that he outsmarted all those tigers. So uh, I think uh, that uh, on a lot of stuff, we need to be more sure about the things we present. I submit that uh, 
Mike probably never read the story of Wu Black Sandal. Uh, well, then that should not have been presented. Uh, the, the thing is, is that uh, there was a lot of racism. And right here in Chicago, I used to see many front lawns that had a black uh, man in a, in a hat holding a lantern outside of the house. And this was very much a, a racist uh, thing. There were enough racist things without having to present things that, in fact, weren't racist. And, but it, nothing was ever all black or all white. There were, there were white people that um, uh, tried to do right by black people. And uh, there, there was never a, uh, a total thing where everybody hated blacks. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Okay, next please. Thank you, Mr. Travis. Four or five? Five. I got a clock right here. You can see it. I got a clock. You can see it from the from your podium. But I said that at the beginning. I'll restart. Ready? Okay, go. Um, the one thing that I ask at a Freedom of Speech Forum when I ask a question, if the answer, whether I like it or don't like it or agree with the premise of it, that's the answer or not, is if at least there's some where within the question that I asked, some kind of answer that relates to the question I asked. So I'll ask the question again, give the speaker a chance uh, at the end to please answer it. Uh, what you need? Do you, do you really think that a party of Abraham Lincoln with total control doesn't have a responsibility to address the greatest crime possibly in the United States history, the transatlantic slave trade, uh, through a truth commission, which was your premise, but I'm having a very difficult time remembering where you stuck on message of focusing on the premise. So you were all over the place. So I'm not saying that's bad, that's your right. It's just very confusing to focus on something in a short amount of time, which this forum is. So. <coughs> Just the different style of speaker, I guess. Um, this is a piece I've been writing uh, from our own constitution, which is part of the problem, because it was written by a bunch of rich, slave-owning white guys. So a constitution is flawed, but here's some of my thoughts on our constitution in 2017 as it relates to what I think is probably the most dangerous person to ever be head of state, and that's saying a lot in a country that has a history of people who brutalized an entire race of people stolen from their homeland, which is Africa. Ours is a duty to form not a failed experiment, but a more perfect union. Ours is a duty not to commit crimes, but to establish justice. Ours is a duty not to unleash deadly chaos, but to ensure domestic tranquility. Ours is a duty not to aid and abet mass surrender, but to provide for the common defense. Ours is a duty not to cause mass suffering, but to promote the general wel welfare. Ours is a duty not to erupt the flames of tyranny, but to secure the blessings of liberty. And so those masses who are hungry for another earth, and those souls who lived long enough before all of us didn't conspire to for force a collapsing from within, instead they chose a different path. They established a constitution. And as imperfect and as in incomplete as it is and still, as it was and still is, as unprepared for the countless challenges of a modern world as one which lacked the luxury of having a crystal ball in order to supernaturally anticipate those future eras, it is indeed a fact that today it remains one of the strongest reasons we are respected all over the world as a people who have a genuine potential for a particular dynamic 
greatness that we all yearn to find in working class and middle class communities, no matter who we are or where we're from or whether we're independents or Republicans, which I don't know what that term means anymore. These aren't the days of Dwight Eisenhower anymore. They aren't even the days of Barry Goldwater anymore. We've gone into extinctionist cuckoo territory with Trump and Pence. Um, what do we yearn to find? Humanism, civilizationism, we the peopleism, equalityism, democracyism, and at the risk of sounding absolutely ridiculous, a uh, first mass solidarity instead of a six mass extinction. Um, yeah, you talk a lot about his supporters being accused of being Nazis. I don't accuse them of being Nazis. I accuse them of being worse than that. I accuse them of being extinctionists because that's what they talk about proudly every chance they get. I think there's been more answer or questions established in this talk this evening than answers and you know it's 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 the, I guess the sign of the times. Right. Okay, Jonathan. Next, please. Five minutes. Now, Box give here. me a one minute warning if I go too long. Oh, you'll have a uh, So, Mike, uh, thanks for a great talk. Very interesting. Uh, I always come here to hear not what I agree with, but what I don't agree with. And usually I get a pretty good talk out of that. Uh, you probably said a lot about the Republican Party, but you had so much in there that I may have forgotten. But certainly, uh, the Republican Party came out of the Federalist Party, the Whig Party, and then the Republican Party. A lot of those people were certainly racist. You mentioned Abraham Lincoln. Certainly he was. No question about it. Uh, other later uh, presidents and earlier presidents, some of them owned slaves, some of them said goodbye to the black people right after, uh, say, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, uh, president 1876. Uh, they decided we'd rather have a Republican president than save the black people in the South. That's my interpretation. But certainly, uh, I do not defend the Democratic Party. I do not defend the Republican Party. I'm not a member of either. And the only party I'm a member of, uh, I'm not sure what they believe, DSA. I better read their literature rather than just give them money. But certainly, it gave me a chance, your talk gave me a chance to look in the mirror uh, I certainly got a long way to go. I s certainly think I've had a long way to go. I don't know about the people in the audience, but I live in an integrated community. Not only my church, Hollywood House, Jane Addams Senior Caucus, all of these are integrated uh, communities and organizations. We're struggling with the issue of racism. Uh, again, I look in the mirror. I've got to change myself. I think I have. But uh, I don't really think too much of the libertarians you're talking about. Milton Friedman, to me, wasn't that much of a, uh, a race-neutral person. I don't think he cared too much about at least what I've read about him about uh, uh, black people and about integration and about taking care of everyone, room, like stuff for room for all and uh, no one left behind. These are things I believe in. Room for all and no one left behind. Certainly we've left behind a lot of people and some of them are white. Some of them are white. We have to take care of everyone. Thank you. All right. All right good. I'm going to go next, and I'm going to show you guys first. We're going to show you something that will. This is a commercial. 
that I think would have really done a libertarian. Of course, yeah. it's a libertarian commercial, Charlie. It was probably one of the best well produced commercials during the things. I'm Governor Gary Johnson. I'm Governor Bill Weld. I'm running for president. I'm running with him. As the governor of New Mexico, I vetoed wasteful spending 750 times, cut taxes 14 times, and left the state with new highways, bridges, schools, hospitals, and a billion dollar surplus without raising taxes a penny. As governor of Massachusetts, I cut taxes 21 times and took unemployment from the highest rate among the 11 industrialized states to the lowest. And he did that in his first term. It was easy. As a Republican, I was re-elected by my Democrat state in a landslide. Ditto. I support marriage equality. I support a woman's right to choose. I want term limits. Internet freedom is a must. Intelligent immigration reform. Small, efficient government that treats the American people like family instead of livestock. I believe in personal freedom. I want government out of your pocketbook and out of your bedroom. It's time to end the wars and use those dollars here at home. between the two of us and the other candidates running for president is that we've been there and done that. We both balance budgets. We both battled corruption and won. Give us one term, America, and if after four years you decide you don't like peace, prosperity, and freedom, you can always vote a Trump or a Hillary back into office again. <laughs> what say, America? You in? Come on. yet. You in? Yeah, there are people in this country who believe in hope. And maybe it might not be so bad to hear the death nail of the Democrats and Republicans, because there are people, and they call themselves libertarians, that are quite ready to take up the reins of power and bring some conventional good conduct and wisdom back into the fold of the United States government. No, I don't exactly agree with all the libertarian principles, but, and they may be at only two to five percent right now, but as their word spreads, they can do. Maybe it might be time to bring them into power and bring some real competition to the republicrats of our country right now. Them, along with some of the other third parties, may be something. We gotta get rid of the duopoly. We gotta bring competition back into politics. Because I'll tell you, when there's competition and true market forces in an election, we really provide the best leader. Thank you. All right, Charlie, let's hear it. All right, Charlie. <laughs> all right, let's thank our speaker. I don't think we did put together all this stuff, and that's a pretty interesting program there. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, first of all, the libertarians. Uh, we just suffered through the commercial. Uh, I did research on what exactly was the transportation policy of that candidate you were advancing. Yes. Uh, he had absolutely nothing to say other than abolish. He would abolish the Department of Transportation. He didn't offer any alternative. That's not legitimate. He's not a legitimate candidate. Hey, you can't that is, that is keep not in control a policy of local governments, Charlie. For, for, for thing as extensive that affects as, our lives as much as transportation does. Say, well, uh, that's a non-answer. I'm sorry, that really isn't. <laughs> and he's not worthy of consideration. Another day tonight, we heard uh, some discussion of the war on poverty. As a matter of fact, my first positions uh, out of uh, school was uh, both as an undergrad and a graduate were in conjunction with the war on poverty in the United States and different, 
different capacities. Uh, the Republican Party had did nothing to replace it when they didn't like it. Uh, and so Reagan came along and he abolished the Office of Economic Opportunities to the, the, the very bottom and offered nothing to replace it with and no concern whatsoever uh, regarding the economic situation of the people uh, to alleviate poverty. So being critical of it is, is easy. Offering an alternative seems to be a little bit tougher. Uh, regarding coal, um, we're going to be talking the ecological issues here next week. Coal is a major contributor to uh, climate warming. It's a, it's a nefarious, it produces nefarious greenhouse gases. There's no method of sequestering the gases, I'm sorry. There isn't. I posted things on this to the point where, um, before the election and many times, so this makes where these Chicago Greens, if, if you don't need to get into ecological issues, I think a lot of you are old enough to remember the problem I lived on the East Coast was acid rain destroyed the forests of the United States. This is not a thing. Last week, the Republican Party came along and got rid of uh, regulations so that coal mines could, depart, could uh, not be subject to controls over destroying the streams of Appalachia. I lived in Appalachia for 10 years. I used to spend my weekends going on those streams and things like that. I said, why would they want to do that? Why would they want to destroy that environment? I used to enjoy that, going out on Sundays. I didn't, get, I didn't go, we didn't have much to do in the country. I'd go down those streams. I'd even clear them out and stuff like this. And they wanted to get rid of the pollute them. The other thing going on in coal mining is, is, is the hilltop removal. Uh, the guy just passed away that started that movement. This is terrible. The mountaintop removal that's going on there. The other thing is they're getting all the coal out of Wyoming. I'm a railroad guy. There's four track main line. Mm -hmm. That means two going in, two tracks coming out all day long, full of coal. Um, Wyoming, that's what the power plants are using, not Appalachian coal. Not they, and even they're not even using the coal from Wyoming. Open pits, they're using gas now. So this guy comes along and he says, I'm going to open the mines in Appalachia. I lived, I lived in Pocahontas County and all that, that's CSX territory. Those lines are nines are not going to open. It's economically infeasible. And to say I'm going to open those mines is irresponsible. <laughs> it is not going to happen. If you want, I'll show you the things on coal loadings from Trains Magazine. And you can see where the coal, it's not a thing aren't even shipping coal. And they're certainly not going to do it from the most expensive source of those mines down in West Virginia. That's absurd. And to tell people that he's going to open those mines is irresponsible. Now, the other thing I've heard tonight was something about, well, she didn't go here. Or she didn't, Oh, uh, Clinton didn't go there. He, they, the, one of the complaints, oh, gee, I like this. Tonight I heard, hey, hey pal, you've got to do some research here. Oh, she didn't spend any time. She wouldn't go in Ohio. She wouldn't go in Pennsylvania. One of the complaints about this campaign this year, both sides, was that they did 90, something like 90% of the events regarding politicking were in six states, two of which were Ohio and Pennsylvania. Now, we just heard tonight that Clinton didn't spend enough time in Ohio. Now, the other thing about campaigning is that campaigns are not all event. They do mailings, they buy commercials, they open offices, they do phone banking. There's about 25 different things to do besides having a little little party in which you get a couple hundred people and go in with balloons. That's not what campaigning is all about. And you decide what you want to do or it's most effectively used. In my mind, media is the most effective thing rather than rallies. I'd go on the low side. But that's neither here nor there. All right, I think that's about it. I haven't covered it. Um, uh, 
I got one other thing here. Democrats on CRA. What's that stand for? I can't remember. Anyhow, I'll think of it later. Very good, Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Did I use up my time? Yeah, you did. But you went over oh. that. Maybe oh, a couple Andy. minutes. What's CRA? <laughs> Cover your ass. Cover your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you Alan. Good to see you okay. Andy, if you need to go a little longer, I can All understand, right. okay? Okay, maybe a minute. We'll see. All right, I'll adjust. Your, your time's right here on the screen, Andy. Okay. There, uh, the first thing I want to mention right off the top is there are some sources of reality-based news that will give you facts that you can uh, <clears throat> check double check from other sources and you can determine what's real and what isn't because too many people in America are promoting viewpoints and opinions that are not based on what really happened and people are living in illusion. One of those giant illusions is of course that Trump was elected president. He wasn't. <clears throat> Common Dreams, uh, Greg Palast, uh, I think it's gregpalast.com but anyway the man's name is Greg Palast. He's an investigator of boat fraud, of boat theft, boat suppression, and how this election, <clears throat> the boat totals were, you know, uh, adjusted to put Trump into the White House. Uh, Project Censored is the other one. Project Censored out of California. Let me get those three. Repeat those three sources. Those are three of the most highly credible, uh, non-denominational, not Democrat or Republican sources. They're just simply common sense progressive. CommonDreams.org, Greg Palast, and Project Censored. And they will give you links to hundreds of other credible sites. There's an old biblical saying in many religions, you know, by their actions shall ye know them. In modern times we say actions speak louder than words. Look at, compare Trump's words that he promises he made on the election and campaign trail to his actions now. If you judge people according to the principles that Jesus taught, help the sick, help the poor, uh, try to safeguard the environment, uh, treat people fairly with dignity and respect, don't be racist. Every one of Trump's appointees, every last one of them, is 100% antichrist. There's not a one of them in there that couldn't be impeached and prosecuted for some sort of uh, corporate fraud, criminal fraud, uh, racism. Uh, <clears throat> Trump talks, you know, the best way to say it is they're putting the fox in charge of the hen house. And uh, Tom Hartman said it's not so much hiring a fox to guard the hen house, it is to pick the one fox that wants to tear it up and obliterate it and just scatter everything <laughs> into the wind. <clears throat> uh, total destruction. Great moments in history that we've tolerated in this country. 1967, a man said, there's no problem with our nuclear industry. We can absorb one Chernobyl per year on American soil in exchange yeah. for cheap electricity. In 1983, a man in the president's cabinet was saying, there's no problem with nuclear war as long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. In 1985, James Watt was saying, environment must first be destroyed as fast as possible to bring about the second coming of Christ. We're going to fulfill Bible prophecy with the upcoming nuclear war. These people are fundamentally insane and should be treated for mental illness, but they're in uh, high positions, right? high-ranking positions. Virtually all of Trump's appointees hold insane views of one kind or another. They're so far out of touch with reality, they would be uh, grounds for treatment for mental illness. <clears throat> Time and time again, they're referring to Trump as the president. Trump should be referred to as the criminal masquerading as our president. Trump is not the president of the United States, not the duly elected one. He's a criminal that was installed by the most criminally corrupt, massively criminal election this country has ever seen. Trump lost the popular vote by millions, and that's not counting the millions of votes they didn't count yeah. in California right. and other states. Yeah. Trump lost it in a landslide for one thing. Ten million votes. Two, Trump lost the electoral vote, and then they changed the totals after we went to bed. 
Greg Palace site talks about that. There's no way that you can consider that less than 25% of the American people actually voted for Trump, and two-thirds of them were holding their nose to uh, keep the stench away from themselves while they cast a vote for him okay. because Hillary and uh, the whole establishment, people are sick and tired of the corrupt establishment, as uh, <coughs> Greg, uh, Jim Hightower said in 2003. Look at this list of legislation the Republicans passed. Look at this list of bills. To pass legislation like this, you need perverts. Ordinary people with a pulse and a conscience won't pass this legislation. You need people that are psychologically, sexually perverted, people that can be blackmailed. There's a new study out showing that about a third of the Congress <clears throat> and a majority of the, of the Republican Senate and uh, Congress is being blackmailed for all kinds of uh, sexual pedophile deviance and everything else. And uh, the, the study is showing that people that have pedophile tendencies are groomed to become politicians, high ranking in the Republican Party, and then these billionaires own them. You wonder why they're voting so much for, for toxic sludge passed as American legislation that's destroying the country. Well, it's because uh, there's videotapes of these people having sex with 9, 10, 11 year old boys and girls. I That's mean, it's the true. Franklin scandal that was written 30 years, years ago. It's a totally toxic subject. It's a third, third rail. And okay. so, uh, you know, we have to address these issues and <clears throat> face the reality. As I said, you know, okay. Trump lost the popular vote. He lost the electoral vote. He lost it in a landslide, and he was installed. So start with that, and uh, don't don't ever say Trump was elected. He wasn't. He's an illegitimate president. He, de he deserves to be impeached and removed at the earliest opportunity. They, well, they deserve a clean house. Sessions has to go with him, along with a bunch of others. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, Mike gets the last word. <coughs> Mike gets, gets the last word. I got a lot to rebut here. Go ahead. The Russian Um. Well, David's gone, but he did raise the issue that there were whites who were kind. Uh, to blacks, and he gave the example of the Jews, and that is true. The Jews, in general, treated blacks better than the whites did. But I said the Jews and the whites separately. If you ask Hitler, if you ask a white segregationist, if you ask any Democrat back in those days, Jews were not considered white. So that doesn't really prove anything. He also defended little black Sambo. Well, Okay, I guess he, that is one of the first books you got back in when he was growing up, when he was a kid, and I'm sure he loved reading the story. I don't think he could use that book today, so I think I was right to uh, uh, bring it up. Um, Jonathan. Jonathan. <laughs> the party of uh, Abraham Lincoln, as you said, uh, he, actually, Abraham Lincoln was a Whig, and when the Whigs collapsed, he went in to the Republican Party. Um, he, the Whigs believed that there was a uh, coalition to be made uh, between business and the political parties. Lincoln's uh, supporters were the railroads. They did not want to pay to get rid of the Indians. So uh, what Lincoln promised them was that if they gave him money, uh, he would um, use the military to clear the Indians out of the way to lay down the railroads. Uh, one of his first acts was a mass lynching of 34 Indians um, that he approved. Uh, that you can look up. It's it's not hidden. Um, so he let the railroads know that he was going to get them engines. Um, I do not consider uh, him to be a Republican. Uh, he was a Whig. Uh, he'd only switched over a year, and like I said, um, his beliefs didn't match the Republican Party at the time. Lincoln stole the election, uh, or actually stole the nomination. Uh, his men printed up fake delegate passes, and while the guy who had all of the delegates was having a parade, they filled the hall with Lincoln people. 
they had told the Republican Party that Lincoln wasn't from Illinois. And the Illinois uh, Republican Party uh, filled up the hall, and the guy who was supposed to get the nomination didn't. Um, you also said about reparations. Thank you. Um, you know how I said earlier that a lot of white people believe they are part Cherokee. Now the reason white people do this, and their parents told them this, and their grandparents, like at some time in the 1900s, it was okay to marry Indians. Absolutely incorrect. Nowhere, maybe in Oklahoma, but nowhere else in America could whites uh, marry American Indians. Um, so why do so many whites say that they're part Cherokee? Well, the reason they do is they want to feel a kinship to the land. They don't want to just think of themselves as an immigrant. By saying they're part Indian, they're saying they're part of this country from the beginning. Now, what do black people say? That's a fascinating question. Oprah Winfrey, on her TV show and in her magazine and in her basic beliefs, said she's a Zulu, that she had traced her roots and discovered she was a Zulu. If you ask the vast majority of black people, where are your ancestors from? They will say they were Zulus. The same way that white people will say they are part Cherokee. There's a problem. South Africa is on the other end of Africa. All you have to do is look at a map. No one was going through the jungles of Africa carrying slaves to West Africa to sell. There were no Zulu slaves. There was no Zulu slave trade. So in other words, if we give reparations, we're going to ask black people, where are you from? Who, what tribe are you connected to? And they're going to say, well, Zulu. The same way white people, if asked what Indian tribe, will say Cherokee. Guess what? They're both wrong. 90% of the blacks will get nothing on reparations because they can't prove what tribe they were from, and if they said Zulu, they would be instantly rejected. The way to help people in the ghetto is to remove the $12,000 fee you have to pay to Chicago to manicure nails. I think you can manicure nails in your home without having to pay $12,000 and go to a city-sponsored class to do it. By having a free market, you open up what people can do. I, there shouldn't be a $12,000 fee to manicure damn fingernails. Now, we also have, you also raised, um, the, I think it's important to remember that the vote for Trump was not for Trump. Everybody keeps thinking it was for Trump. It was a protest vote. Why? They said, well, he said, grab him by the pussy. He said this. He said that. Oh, my God, how can we do it? The protest vote was because they no longer fall for your fake sense of outrage. For Hillary Clinton to stand there and say, how could a man treat a woman like that? My husband would never do that. No one believes her. The only people that believe her are the people sitting in that corner table. No one believes her anymore. It was fake outrage, and it doesn't sell. If it sold, she only lost by 100,000 votes. If it actually was believable, she would have won. But when she got up there and said, she when, did she, win. She, when she got she up there, win. she did win. Nobody complained about electoral votes when Obama beat Hillary. Hillary won. Simple math. Hillary won the popular vote against Obama, but he won the electoral votes. I don't remember seeing any cars on fire, any people being beaten up, any any uh, police being attacked when that happened. Hillary won the popular vote against Obama. So what is your damn problem? I Next, Jim. My tour guide, Jim, just. when you raised the thing about Milton Friedman, there's one thing that Milton Friedman did that I think we all owe him a thanks for. He ended the draft. 
He stopped the draft. He convinced Nixon to end the draft. That was a pretty heavy thing back then. If you were living in a age to be drafted and afraid of being drafted and sent to Vietnam, when Friedman talked Nixon into ending it, that is something to be applauded, even if you hate everything else he did. Ending the draft, I think, was important. Um, Tim? Um, yeah, I like the end. Uh, Charles, uh, you keep saying, if you're going to take away one government agency, I want to know what government agency you're going to replace it with. Um, no. Wrong. You, wait, we, we're poor. We take away the They're government still agency. Poor. Are you going to do anything to make them poor? I'm, I'm answering your rebuttal. Are you going to do anything to make them Are you going to let me answer your rebuttal? No, you don't care. What right? happened to one fool at a time? You're <laughs> uh, not rich. I'm not going to replace one block. I'm not going to take uh, away the permits and licenses of $12,000 from somebody in the ghetto that wants to do nails in their living room. And then put in tour guides. And then put in $8,000 permit. No, I'm going to get rid of the permits and licenses and them. declare the black neighborhoods to be free market zones. It already is. If you go down an alley in Humboldt Park or in Bronzeville, You'll pass by a garage where people have tables and chairs set up in the garage and they're serving food and liquor. They have an illegal restaurant. There were illegal food trucks for years in Chicago, in the ghettos, until the city gave up trying to stop them and decided, well, let's make them buy a permit. Already, and white people are doing it too. If you go to Lincoln Park, if you go to the Gold Coast, there's a, a site you can look up on the website called Eating Vincent Price. What is it called? Eating Vincent Price. And what happens is once a week, they meet at a rich person's house. They pay $150 a piece. A chef from New York or San Francisco is flown in. They serve food. They serve wine. Guess how much they pay in taxes? Nothing. Do they think they're rebelling? Do they think they're fighting back against the Democratic Party? No. But the fact is they are. I do know because they have to do a legal You restaurant. haven't got one thing you're going to do to help the black people now, in the city. Now, the next thing nothing. Yet, you is said that nothing. Charles brought up... <laughs> what? Nothing. The other thing is that Charles brought up about science. That's very interesting that he did that because I... Actually, the person that I'm living with right now uh, works at the Argonne Science Lab. So in the last year, I have met many scientists. I have a perspective on it I never had before. Okay? So there are two things. Remember when they told us we were going to, the same people who tell us we're going to have global warming, the same people told us, we're going to have 50 inches of snow. Look outside. Look outside. Look outside. Where's the snow? Where's the, where's the 50 inches? How about five? How, but they can tell us what we're going to have in 100 years, in 500 years. Al Gore. Al Gore said in 2015, there would be five to seven inches of standing water in New York City. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Tell me now where is it, Charles? Do you know what the difference between climate and Now, water? the problem is You're a scientist. that in science, there are fluctuations, oh. and there is I don't know. But for politicians, there is no I don't know. There is no fluctuation. Al Gore can't say I don't know. Al Gore has to say, in 2015, there will be five to seven inches of water so we have, standing in New we York. Have to worry about global now, warming? There's no deadline? We were told by the people who believe in global warming, Jeez. we would have 50 inches of snow. Where is it? But, but 
But they say they can tell us the weather in 500 years. Why do they have an international treaty? They treaty? tell us we are the first country on earth to send our electronics to China to be buried in landfills. We are paying to have our electronics shipped overseas to be buried in landfills. Let me ask you a question. What happens when people find out that China is on this planet? It's supposed to help the planet. We're sending all of our stuff to China to be buried in landfills. That saves the planet. What happens if a fifth grader looks in a geography book and realizes China is on the earth? We have been had. We have been had and lied to big time. Now, there is a science march coming up. Okay, we're going to have to. Edit and it like guess a what the, is happening with the science march? They are marching for ch transgender rights. They are marching for freedom for Palestine. You have to hate Israel to be in this march. May I ask a question? What does this have to do with science? I looked at their list of demands. There's over a hundred demands for the March of Science. They don't list their own demands until the bottom of the list. So the first hundred demands are gay rights, transgender rights. The Science March has nothing to do with science. What happened? How did it get watered down? How did so many demands get thrown in? Now, I have a suggestion. Instead of telling us what we need to do to fix the planet in 100 years, in 100 years, do you know how you could get conservatives involved? How you could get people who don't even believe in global warming involved? How about we set our goals for what we can do in five years, in 10 years, instead of 500 years, when you can't even tell me what the weather's okay. going to be next Saturday. Um, okay. Now, I, I wanted to mention some of your things just real quick. Well, we got there. No, no, we uh, got to close today. We got to leave in like okay. three minutes. Uh, Hillary got her money from Wall Street. You can Google that. That was revealed by WikiLeaks. She spoke in front of Wall Street right. to get money. Trump was opposed by the Republican Party. Trump was opposed by Wall Street. Trump was opposed by the media. You keep saying he was placed in by them. He was he not was. placed in by them. Okay. The Electoral College is not tied to Wall Street. And like I pointed out, Hillary beat Obama in the popular vote. I didn't see anybody riot then. Okay, Mike, and we have it. to... Thanks. Okay, let us out. Right. Thanks a lot, Mike. The College of Complex is adjourned.